This is Masters in Business with Barry Ritholtz on Bloomberg Radio. This week on the podcast, I have yet another extra special guest, and this is really a fascinating extra special guest who you probably never heard of, but you should. His name is Ken Tropin. Uh, where do I even begin with him? He He's a member of the Futures Hall of Fame. Uh, he's the chairman and founder of Graham Capital Management, which runs $18 billion and has amassed a uh, quite a track record. Uh, he used to work with John Henry, currently the owner of the Boston Red Sox, and another successful hedge fund manager. He worked with Paul Tudor Jones. Uh, the list of people he knows and has um, trained with and under is, is quite astonishing. Uh, the firm that he's built uh, is one of those very quiet, very successful um, entities that without a whole lot of media coverage, without a whole lot of fanfare, just amass an enormous amount of capital because they've done so well for their clients over time. Um, I found the conversation with Ken to be absolutely uh, fascinating. And I think you will also, if you're at all interested in macro investing, trend following, commodities, currencies, fixed income, uh, various types of quantitative strategies, uh, and most important of all, risk management, you're going to find this conversation to be absolutely fascinating. With no further ado, my interview of GCM's Ken Tropin. I want to start with your background. You, you began at Shearson in, in the 1980s. Tell us a little bit about those days. Well, you know, uh, here we are um, at a very different place in time, so it's kind of cool to reflect back on what was happening in 1980. Like uh, very diff different universe, right? Right. Well, for example, interest rates were 14% <laughs> right. uh, when I started at Shearson. And, and those were those were treasuries. We're not talking junk bonds. Yeah, right? no, no, no. And, and in fact, I think we got as high as 20 early in my career. And so, uh, you know, it was... Uh, a very interesting time to begin, which I, I did as a, an account executive at Shearson. And then in 1982, uh, Dean Witter recruited me to join them and to really start managing what was their fledgling hedge fund uh, practice, mm -hmm. uh, which was really with CTAs back in that era. And then right. it evolved into, you know, more macro style funds. So, so you eventually become director of managed futures at Dean Witter Reynolds. Yep. That's pretty early in, in the managed futures history. Tell us a little bit about that era. Sure. It was a, you know, uh, it was a era where, you know, first of all, the markets were really inefficient, right? Right. Um, so it was, it was very fertile uh, to do what we do because uh, markets moved a lot. There was a lot of volatility. Uh, and I, I think it's almost the polar opposite of where, the world has been the last few years where volatility has been somewhat subdued and, you know, uh, equities have been such a strong performer. But back in 1982, um, you know, stocks were very quiet. Uh, they were in a trading range. Interest rates were super high. Uh, commodity markets were moving a lot. And there wasn't a lot of competition if you were a trader in that early part of the industry's history. So, so let's talk about that inefficiency for a moment. Today, you want to hang a shingle or you want to open your own proprietary trading. It's very difficult to find an edge and consistently make money. Back in the 1980s, that wasn't necessarily the case. Yeah, I mean, relatively simple trading systems made money. And, uh, and, and you know, they had volatility and people were okay with volatility because everything was volatile back then. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, you know, it was... Uh, you know, relatively, I won't say straightforward because I don't think uh, generating consistent profits has ever been something that's so straightforward or so easy. But on a relative basis, it was easier. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, when you have a young industry, that's a great time to get involved. Yeah, to say the very least. So after Dean Witter Reynolds, you end up as CEO of John Henry and Company. Tell us a little bit about that experience. Yeah, John was one of our managers uh, that we had, uh, you know, our clients invest in. And in 1989, um, he and I explored uh, me leaving Dean Witter to join his firm as CEO. 
his company was in California at the time. I wanted to be on the East Coast. We moved the firm to Connecticut. Uh, and uh, I was there for about four and a half years. Mm-hmm. And then he and I saw things differently in 1993 and uh, I parted company and, uh, you know, uh, had a, a lot of time to think about what I wanted to do and ultimately decided I wanted to start up my own fund. And uh, that's how Graham got, uh, you know, underway in the, you know, spring of 1994. So we're going to talk a lot more about Graham, but. John Henry seemed to have done pretty okay for himself. Sure, uh, I mean he now owns the Red Sox and uh, a lot of relocated to Boston, and, right? Uh, you know he's done very, very, very well. He's left the finance world, but he's mm-hmm. certainly not left the business world. And he seemed to have brought the same set of analytical chops to owning the Red Sox as he did in his own hedge fund. Yeah, I think that's kind of who he is quantitative, data-based, and logical decisions, which, you know, seems to have broken uh, the curse of the babe. Well, you, you, you know, let's face it, right? I mean, what was it? What was the year that they were down 3-0 and to the Yankees or something, and then they right. ended up prevailing in that World Series? Uh, I'm a Yankee fan, so I can't say I was rooting for that, but that's what happened. It, it 100 years uh, was all it took to yeah. overcome that one mistake. All right, so let's talk a little bit about founding Graham Capital in 1994. You leave John Henry. You have a little time to think about what you want to do. What was the process like launching a new hedge fund uh, in the early to mid-90s? You know, it was, I mean, this is not an easy thing to do ever. I would say it was probably somewhat, um, you know, easier to do in 94 than it would be today, where the world has become so institutional. Uh, And... You know, I've been longtime close friends uh, with Paul Jones and Mark mm-hmm. Dalton, the president, and, uh, you know, when Paul, the, the founder and uh, CEO of Tudor. And uh, when I left Henry, we talked about should I, you know, a couple of ideas I had about starting my own fund, and uh, they were kind enough and, uh, and, and eager uh, to uh, invest and help me seed Graham, which made it a lot easier to get the fund off the ground. And sure. I invested my prop capital alongside of their prop capital. And we began trading in, uh, you know, I guess it was July or something like that of 1994. Mm-hmm. What sort of strategies were you using when you first launched the firm? Yeah, so it was trend following systems that I designed. Uh, and uh, they had some features to them that uh, were intended to uh, take advantage of what's very good about trend following, which is sort of capturing these big right tail moves, Mm -hmm. but we're also intended to not have some of the givebacks that people associate with trend following when trends reverse. And uh, those were techniques that I came up with that I thought would work. They ended up being pretty successful. And that's, you know, in the early days of of Graham, uh, like any new hedge fund, I did everything from designing uh, trading systems to executing those systems. So so let's talk a little bit about trend following because people who are uh, professional traders or especially uh, futures and commodities traders are fairly familiar with that strategy. I don't know if all our listeners are. The basic concept is when one of these asset classes starts a long move, they tend to go much further and much longer than people typically expect, and you want to capture as much of that move as possible. Is that yeah, too a, much of a an oversimplification? Good description. Yeah. And uh, think of it this way, that uh, a good trend-following system will identify, based on momentum uh, signals, that a trend is underway. Let's take a recent example, uh, energy prices. Everybody knows energy prices have gone up in the last six months quite a bit. And, you know, uh, a, a simple trend following system is going to identify that uh, this is a strong trend and is going to get you on the right side of that trend. Now, at some point, that trend is going to end and uh, that same trend following system is never going to predict the exact top, but it's going to get you out of that trend after it's made some amount of profit on the way up. And it's, and it's always going to expect to lose some of those profits uh, when the trend reverses but still end up capturing the meat of the trend. So if you could say that the maximum size of a trend was say 100, maybe you might capture 60, 70% of that trend. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you're able to do that in a diverse uh, number of markets and asset classes, uh, while managing risk in the markets that aren't trending, Mm -hmm. you know, that's in general how trend following works. It's 
much better to be involved in trend following when markets are moving and when markets are quiet and sideways, not as easy to make money in trend following. Right, right. How, how do you avoid, uh, I'm thinking about how, how you catch the reversal at the end. Obviously, you have to be willing to give back some of the profits before it's clear that the trend was broken. Uh, how do you avoid the false positives, the whipsaws? I can't count how many times when I was a young Turk on a trading desk, you would get shaken out of a move and then it would, as soon as you're gone, immediately go back to the prior trend. So there are lots of, it's a great question. There are a lot of technologies that people use that we use. Um, you know, uh, some of those technologies can include having multiple signals mm -hmm. and multiple time horizons. So maybe your quick systems get shaken out on a on, on a sort of minor or medium reversal, mm -hmm. but your longer term systems, for example, take longer to get knocked out. And so most people I know who do this do not have one time horizon. Right. They use multiple time horizons. That's just an example of a technique right. that's easy to understand. You guys do everything from quantitative analysis to macro. Tell us a little bit about your approach to trading the markets. Sure, well, there's, as you sort of referenced, we do a lot of different trading styles at Graham. We do discretionary macro trading, which is typically a portfolio manager, and we have um, some number of portfolio managers, 15 or 18 different portfolio managers that independently manage uh, a book of, of you know, uh, risk assets, and uh, they uh, will decide what they're gonna buy and sell, uh, and uh, they're gonna live with certain risk policies, and they're going to hopefully not be all doing the same thing at the same time. <laughs> uh, and then we also run a bit large quantitative business, which is a model-driven, uh, you know, computer, uh, you know, uh, trading system uh, business that, uh, is also really diversified in the types of models it uses. Some are pure momentum-based models, which people identify with trend following. Mm -hmm. But then there are some models that are value-based, that are fundamentally based. Uh, some that uh, you know are smart systems that are learning mm -hmm. systems. So there are a lot of different ways to hopefully make money in the macro markets that we are involved huh. in. So, so let's talk a little bit about that diversification. If you have 18 different portfolio managers, and I know you're only half joking when you say, we hope they're not all doing the same things, by design, the assumption is each of them are bringing a different approach to the assets they're covering, or is it possible that some of them are overlapping with others? Yeah, well, the, the answer is yes to both. So we currently have 15 different teams, not 18, although there are a couple of teams that are pretty close to joining us. and. Uh, many of them are going to be trading the most important macro markets. So that, mm -hmm. you know, that's fixed income markets, uh, that's the equity markets, that's the foreign exchange markets, and to some extent commodities. And uh, some of them are going to have similar views when really interesting big moves are happening. Uh, an example of that is there was a big move up in rates mm -hmm. that sort of peaked in May, and a lot of our traders got involved in that and benefited from rates going up in Germany and rates going up in the United States. Um, there are other times where they have very different time horizons. And so one trader uh, might, you know, be a uh, long U.S. fixed income and an, a, a, a trader right next to them is, is short. And they could both actually be right depending on the time horizon. Mm -hmm. So somebody who has a very short term trading style could be short for a week and get out and make a profit doing that. Uh, while the other trader who's long is waiting, uh, you know, for six to eight or 12 weeks for his position to accomplish what he thinks it should accomplish. Hmm. So different different time horizons, different assets. We have traders that are involved in, you know, a lot of interest rate derivatives, uh, swaps, the yield curve, um, things that our trading systems don't always get involved in, uh, but our traders will. So for example, as you know, there's been this giant flattening of the yield curve. Mm -hmm. That's been something that a number of our traders have been involved in, something that typically the uh, you know, technical systems wouldn't be uh, so involved in. Hmm. And and you sit on the risk management committee when you have all of these teams with a lot of authority and a lot of independence trading their own models. How do you manage that? That sounds like that's a lot of balls in the air at once. It is, but it you know we have a lot of technology to support all of that. Mm -hmm. We have um, 
risk systems that are live PL reporting models that tell us what every trader's performance is every minute of the day that the markets are open. Wow. And then we meet every day at 930 and have since 2008 to look at every trader's portfolio. How has it changed since the previous day? Who's added to risk? Who's cut risk? What assets are they in? We run stress tests on all of their positions. Uh, we see who's performing well, who's might be struggling. And, you know, if we have to uh, encourage a trader to reduce risk or do nothing, uh, we as the senior management uh, team of the firm are acutely aware of exactly what uh, the firm's risk is at any minute of the day. And I think it's that discipline to meet and have, you know, total transparency into risk taking helps manage, uh, you know, the outcome quite a bit. And you guys have been doing this for almost 30 years, so you obviously know a thing or two about risk management. I look around this year, I see some quant-focused hedge funds blowing up to say nothing of all the venture investments into crypto and some of the crypto funds really just losing 90, 95, in some cases, 100% of their assets. As someone who is a professional risk manager, when you look out, what do you see when when the world around you has these frequent flare-ups? Well, you know, it, it, it always gives you religion about managing <laughs> risk, right? I mean, yeah. at the end of the day, uh, it's, it's awfully important to make money for our clients and on our proprietary capital for ourselves, but uh, the, the only way you're gonna do that is by managing the downside. And so we're just really conservative in our risk policies. We're not so conservative that there's no breathing room to make money because mm -hmm. if you're not willing to lose some money, you can't make any money. I right. mean, it's an age old thing in, right. in, in investing and trading, but uh, the question is how much? And, you know, and, and, and we're just very process driven in how we look at risk, how we analyze it. And we, we you know, we, we're, we, we've learned that we just have to make some hard decisions uh, fairly quickly at certain moments. And we've had moments where we've had traders lose more than we would have liked them to have lost. We've had trading systems that have had bad cycles, but we have prevailed over 29 years because in general, we avoid, uh, you know, uh, some, some really bad experiences that sort of, as you alluded to, we try not to let that happen to us or our clients. It, it, it's pretty clear that a number of the funds that have blown up didn't seem to have a whole lot of risk controls in place. They just let, uh, it's one thing to take a loss, it's another thing to let a bad situation become a fatal one. Yeah, well, I, I think that, you know, kind of speaks to who is Graham. We're a conservative firm. We've been doing this for 29 years. I've been involved in the markets for over 40. Uh, you learn a lot over that amount of time that, you know, you can't be in a hurry to try and make a profit. Right. You've got to just, you know, be a patient investor. You got to be an opportunistic investor. And if you manage conservatively your business, I like the odds of you finding the moments when it's good for what you do and capitalizing on it. You know, I, I, I'm going to editorialize briefly, but I've had this conversation countless times about just be long-term greedy, just be patient, it will come to you. And everybody that seems to get into trouble, whether it's a trader or a fund or whatever, it's always that hurry that seems to cause their disasters. Yeah, that, that, that's a factor for sure. It's not the only one, right? Mm -hmm. Like liquidity can change. Sure. And that is something that can bite you when something that was relatively liquid and easy to get in and out of becomes illiquid. <laughs> Right. Uh, and, you know, we've seen that in some of the situations you described earlier of, of funds having problems. And so one of the things we really scrutinize as risk managers is there is what's happening with liquidity. How is it changing? And is it uh, is there any adverse behavior as relates to liquidity that we should be very careful and thoughtful about? And last question about the various teams does everybody have a different benchmark? How do you track performance? Is it strictly absolute returns or are people working towards a specific uh, bogey that they're they're comparing themselves with? Yeah, it's really an absolute return business. And, you know, we are trying to have our traders, you know, generate, uh, you know, call it uh, high single digits, low double digit returns with relatively 
moderate volatility, so annual volatility of four percent or something like that, mm-hmm. and uh, that's a that's a pretty good ballpark idea of the parameters that we ask traders to live within, and that's a pretty comfortable place for our clients. Uh, you know, meaning our, the amount of risk they're willing to assume relative to potential reward. Correct. Huh, really, really interesting. I want to start talking about the current environment with a quote of yours that I really like. Uh, You said, I can't recall a more interesting time to be a macro investor since the financial crisis. Tell us a little bit about that. I haven't heard a lot of people describe this year, 2022, that way. Yeah, well, you know, because we're a macro-oriented fund, uh, what we're really concerned with is what's happening with interest rates what's happening with foreign exchange, what's happening with commodity prices, uh, and what's happening with equity prices. And all of those four sectors have been moving a lot. And so that's a really fertile, constructive environment for us to try and generate returns. Meaning if they're moving, you're finding opportunities. Exactly. You know, for us, it's nowhere near as uh, productive an environment if asset classes are really quiet. Mm -hmm. Um, If you think about interest rates as an example, you know, uh, today is a Fed meeting, but, uh, you know, think about that Germany didn't raise rates for 10 years until recently, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, just practically speaking, there's going to be less to do if you're trading German interest rates and and the central bank's not moving them for 10 years. Now rates are moving and they're moving a lot. Um, If you think about the U.S., you know, uh, the central bank uh, started giving us something they never used to do, which was forward guidance, right. uh, saying, not only are we not changing rates today, but we're telling you we're not going to change rates for the foreseeable future. I- uh, I'm so glad you said that, because I remember in the 1990s, CNBC used to have the Greenspan briefcase indicator, how thick or thin the briefcase he carried into the FOMC meeting was their hint as to what was going to go on with rates. That's a different world. Now they literally say, this is what we're doing. Uh, Earlier this last week uh, or two weeks ago, um, somebody at the Fed said to Nick Timorous at the Wall Street Journal, hey, we're going 75 basis points. There's no misunderstanding. They are not just telegraphing, explicitly telling us what they're going to do. How does that affect your ability to find opportunities? Well, so here's the thing. If they're telling us they're going to do nothing, that's not so helpful. (laughs) If they're telling us that they're going to be moving interest rates a lot, and they're not just going to do this at one meeting, but over some series of meetings, and for the next year or something, then there's a lot to work with in terms of the markets. They're going to move a lot. They're going to overreact. They're going to give us, uh, you know, trading opportunities both on the long and short side. And so when I say the markets are more interesting than they've been for a really long time, it's for a variety of reasons. Markets are moving. Uh, we've got central banks all over the world uh, starting to move. We've got uh, equity prices moving a lot you know there's a there's a big realization of, of pe's to lower levels right as earnings start to decline and erode uh you've got commodity prices that went through the roof in the first third of this year because of supply chain issues the ukraine war and so on uh and then you've got the dollar making one of the biggest moves that i've seen in a long time like 20 years i yeah. mean we, we we've had a move in dollar yen is 25 percent. we haven't seen that in a long time right. so that that makes and it euro parity is exactly crazy. and so so you've had great moves in a lot of markets and what i'm excited about is i don't see that changing into a quiet moment anytime soon so so let's talk about next year. But before we get to that, I want to ask you about last year. So for 2021 for equity investors, hey, plus 28% seemed like a great year. But if you're a volatility trader, markets were never less than 5% from all-time highs. It was a shockingly quiescent year, straight up and hardly any move. Was 2021 a less interesting year than 2022? Yeah, for sure. Definitely. I mean, we were able to generate on average returns last year. They were a positive year. Mm-hmm. But 
there's way more to do this year. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, last year, if you were going to have a good year, you had to be essentially long beta. Right. And we like from the beginning of the year and correct. And just just be patient and and stay with it. Right. And, you know, we uh, we we certainly did that on a portion of what we uh, look at as our risk budget. But there's we're we're much happier. We're we're going to be more profitable. There's going to be more interesting environment when, uh, you know, you're not looking at one asset class and that's the only game in town. But right. rather there's something to do in foreign exchange or something to do in rates or something to do in commodities, or something to do in credit. All of these asset classes now are moving and moving a lot. So so 2021, not so interesting. 2022, very interesting. Why do you believe 2023 this high interest, high volatility environment is going to continue into next year. Yeah. So I, the question, of course, is uh, I expect there to be plenty of volatility next year. Will it be as volatile as 22? Maybe not. But will it be volatile enough mm-hmm. for it to be fertile for what we do and constructive for what we do? And I think the answer to that is yes. Yeah, so I'm cautiously optimistic that will be the case. And I say that because I think of some of the problems. Uh, that the Fed is trying to manage through and central banks in Europe are trying to manage through these problems. I don't see ending at, you know, when we, when we flip the calendar on 23, right. uh, you know, the supply chain bottlenecks going to end. No, no, it'll soon? all be good. January uh, 1, it'll all go away. Exactly my point. So, so there are secular issues that are causing inflation that I believe the Fed really can't do that much about. Mm-hmm. And I think the problem that inflation causes for central banks are not going away so quickly. Hmm. So I, I I I think this year may be unusually good for for macro, but I think the upcoming several years are going to be also pretty interesting for what we do. So the consensus of economists uh, have the Fed raising seventy five basis points today, July twenty uh, seventh, and then another 75 in September, and then... I think 50 is the, is the base. Is that case. where I mean, that's now moving yeah, back towards? Because the, the prior hint was 75. Yeah, I, I, I but think But the economy that, really seems to be slowing Well, we got advances. that really bad inflation print a few weeks ago. Right, and, for and, and then, you know, we've gotten some weaker data since. Mm-hmm. And so I think people have priced in 50 basis points in the next hike, and then, you and know, then maybe... And then cuts one, in 2023. But it, that's the thing. They're pricing in also cuts in 23 maybe maybe not you know mm-hmm. i, I I'm you're not, not so, in that camp i i'm waiting and see i mean i i think we Makes need to sense. see inflation get a lot closer to the fed's target and uh you know i don't see inflation coming down as rapidly as the market is pricing in fed cuts oh really that's very interesting right so in order for the fed to want to cut they're going to need to see inflation contract quite a bit and it will contract from the very high levels it's at now, but will it go down to their target? I'm not sure. So, so let's talk about commodities: lumber cut in half, copper down thirty yeah. percent, oil under a hundred. What are we like thirty two days in a row of gasoline prices falling? Yeah. Industrial metals also down twenty five thirty percent. Most of the commodity complex that really ran amok seems to be starting to roll over and soften. Uh, how do you view that? Is that I, just... I view that as helpful uh, for sure, but you know, have rents collapsed? No, no, and, uh, and they're sticking housing, too. Housing's really tight. Labor's still really, really tight. The employee still has the upper hand. You know, as it relates is that to... still true? Because the sense seems to be you have layoffs at the tech firms. Yep. They were in a mad dash to hire. Yep. They overhired, and now some of the retailers are talking about easing uh, Amazon and Walmart. It feels like the great resignation is over, and whatever upper hand employees had, they they seem to have have lost a little hand over the past few weeks. I uh, I think that's a perception, not necessarily the reality. Mm-hmm. I think that will become the reality. Mm-hmm. I don't think we're there. I don't think psychology changes so fast. Mm-hmm. So I think you know employees here at Bloomberg, you have a a three, you know, a remote work policy. Right. Uh, you and know, free we, lunch, do, we have so it. Uh, yeah, the perspective and, 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 here is skewed. And, 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 and most firms, you know, have similar policies. Uh, and I think that's reflective of employee having a lot of leverage over employers. And these policies will 
probably evolve, you know, because they all got birthed out of COVID and, right. and so on in an incredibly hot labor market. But uh, I don't see uh, drastic changes yet in uh, how uh, employees are thinking and what their work expectations are. I think they're, we'll get to there, but mm-hmm. we're not there. You know, it used to be, how do you keep them down on the farm once they've seen Gay Paris? And now it's, hey, how the hell do you get them back into the city? They want to work from the farm. The world has changed. Personally, I can't help but notice how much more productive and efficient I am up into a point where, all right, I got to get the hell out of these same four walls. I'm wondering how that extrapolates out to the entire labor market. Yeah, I think it really depends on what people do. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, uh, I think, you know, some people can be very effective uh, working remotely. And I think others are more effective when they collaborate. And they're and and I think it's easier to learn. Right. When you're around uh, people who are very bright and very innovative and, you know, you can hopefully piggyback some of that knowledge and experience and, you know, have it improve your knowledge base and your and, and your skill set and so I, I'm a big fan of of uh, you know people working uh, in offices uh, to a you know a significant degree um, but I also understand that a lot of people really enjoy working remotely and 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 I understand that I mean it's it's it uh, it's very efficient right right but it's pretty clear that it's there's going to be some form of hybrid at most major employers going Correct. forward. I, the question is, is it four and one? Is it three and two? It, it's not going to be zero oh and five like it was for two years. That That's pretty much done. I have to agree with that. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about some interesting trends that we've seen play out in 2022 and, and what whether or not they'll continue for the rest of the year. We haven't talked a lot about equities but if I think of anything in 2022, it's finally value has started to show its uh, advantage after lagging growth for practically a decade. Uh, do you guys look at these sort of factors? Is that one we, of the things we, you consider? We do. I mean, it depends on, you know, our a lot of our trading systems are sort of momentum-based systems, but then we also have value-based quantitative models and our traders are definitely looking at value. Um, and I, you know, I think, look, equities have come down a lot, uh, but I think the, the, be- the, the question is what's next. And, you know, to me, we're, do we test the lows? You know, we've bounced about 7% off the lows uh, in the last few weeks. Uh, you know, it would not surprise me as earnings slow down and, and, you know, the economy slows down and the effect of these rate hikes uh, begins to kick in you know, earnings should deteriorate. And the question is how much and how much will spending contract and things like that? And what kind of demand destruction are we going to see? So uh, I think equities probably uh, have some downside in them. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, the bull case is there's not a lot else to do with money. And so, (laughs) you know, uh, the the sell offs are are pretty well bought by institutional, uh, you know, investors said differently what's already in the price. So let me throw a couple of things at you. Um, We talked earlier down 20 percent, more or less prices in a recession, right? Or at least a mild recession. Is that a fair assessment the way you would think about the macro environment of, of stocks as a leading indicator? I, I You know, I don't, I don't know that that's all priced in there because mm-hmm. think about it. We were up 28% last year, right? right? So it's a lot. And we were down 20% this year. Um, and, and up 21% the year before. Right. So uh, this so, is just a little mean reversion. Yeah, so, so I, I, you know, I, I think of this as sort of a very normal correction right. uh, after the years and years and years. Yeah of unusually good performance for equities. And uh, I'm, I'm not sure you. that a recession is completely priced in. I think I think a slowdown in the economy is somewhat priced in, mm-hmm. but I, th- I think we could see uh, lower prices from here. So, so let's talk about earnings, both second quarter and third quarter. Uh, second quarter earnings uh, have started to trickle out. A few disappointments, but stocks really haven't been punished the way when we saw first quarter 2022 earnings come out in April, if you missed, you got shellacked down yeah. 20, 30 percent. Walmart really, I can't say on radio what they did, but terrible. 
oh, the stock was off eight or nine percent. It's really relative to how badly they missed. I was surprised that that's all they were down. Um, so the question is, uh, what does it mean when stocks aren't punished when bad news comes out? So I, I think perhaps part of the explanation is that there was a deleveraging that occurred in the first quarter. Mm -hmm. And I think that is somewhat behind us. So, Meaning that very richly valued stocks. Yeah, I mean, um, you think so this about, was more multiple con contraction than being punished for missing earnings. I mean, there, you know, there were equity hedge funds that were pretty levered mm -hmm. that had pretty highly concentrated, you know, growth bets and, you know, a lot of technology companies and so on. And, and, and a lot of those equities went down a lot. And those, a lot of those funds had to exit and a lot of investors and, you know, exited some of those positions and they've come back to earth. And so mm -hmm. I think some of the deleveraging has already occurred. And that's why the reaction function is not as severe uh, as you see, new earnings hit the hit the tape. Huh. Really, really intriguing. Um, so let's talk a little bit about third quarter earnings. If the Fed goes fifty or seventy five in September, uh, is the market pricing in a potential uh, decrease from record highs for S and P five hundred earnings? I don't. I don't think we're pricing that yet. Uh, and it, it, I'd be a bit surprised if we don't. If, if we have continuing, uh, you know, erosion of earnings, uh, I think equity prices will follow that. Mm -hmm. um, well, uh, I'm not forecasting another 20% down, but I do right. think we could go down five or 10 without Easily, much problem. right? I mean, yeah. what is, a, that's a bad Tuesday, a down 10%. We, people forget Pretty what, <laughs> a very it's bad a, Tuesday. a very bad Tuesday, yeah. <laughs> um, or, Black or, Tuesday. Uh, that's right. Or, or it's really just a fraction of that. So, so we talked about if this is, pricing in a recession, does it matter if we're in a recession or not now or will be next year? How do you contextualize the economic data and the broad stamp recession when you're thinking about uh, managing risk? You know, we obviously have to, to be concerned with it. And, you know, uh, we, we would not be at all surprised to see are, you know, the economy contract, uh, the Fed's rate hikes take effect, uh, beta slips, um, prices go down somewhat if you're talking about equities. Uh, and then at some point, buyers come back right. and, and invest because there's a perception. And if you think about, you know, the last decade or more, uh, if you didn't buy the dips in equity prices, you were sort of punished by the market. And so, there is a psychology that's been well trained into all investors, institutional and otherwise, that when equities go down a lot, you need to buy, shut your eyes and buy. And so I think we're going to continue to have that behavior occurring. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we'll just have to see how it plays out in terms of uh, where the, you know, what does the market do, not just over the next quarter, but over the next several. You, you were rewarded for buying the dip in 2010 when we had the flash crash. You were rewarded for buying the dip in fourth quarter of 2018 when we were down almost 20%. If you bought into the end of the quarter of the pandemic, March Q1, you were awarded. This seems to be the first year where the dip buyers really got their hands smacked by the market. How long does it take? You've been doing this for 40 years. How long does it take for that psychology of buy the dip, buy the dip, buy the dip, for that muscle memory to get broken? I think it takes a couple of years. Really? Yeah, I don't think like it 08, 09 I I, definitely I had a big impact on people. Yeah, I, I think it takes a couple of years. I don't really think it happens in an, let's face, let's face it, we're five, six months into the year, six, right. uh, seven months into the year now. I mean, I don't think we're there. Um, I think, you know, if we were to see two years of poor performance in equities, the buy the dip psychology would really erode a lot. Mm -hmm. But if you see seven months of poor equity performance, I'm not sure we're there. Huh. So we're halfway through 2022. We're looking out at the rest of the year and into 2023. Any particular asset class or sector that strikes you as intriguing? Energy, you mentioned earlier, had a great year the past 12 months. The banking sector really seems to have missed earnings. What looks interesting? Well, the dollar's really interesting. I mean, the dollar's making a big move and it continues uh, to be 
uh, a currency, right, that has uh, positive carry versus uh, its its counterparts. So, you know, rates in the United States are, are still considerably higher than mm-hmm. the rest of the world. Look at And look that at attracts the, capital. That's going to attract capital. So, the, you know, uh, until proven otherwise, I mean, uh, you know, uh, Japan is committed to, <laughs> you know, uh, a maximum uh, rate of 25 basis points uh, while the U.S., is marching on up 75 basis points today. So, you know, I I think the dollar continues to intrigue me. Uh, you know, it's moved a lot. Uh, we have to be cognizant of that. We've seen, you know, the dollar move 25% against the yen. Huge. But could it go more? I, I think so. And could it go more against the euro? I think so. So so here's the pushback from my gold bug friends um, who, who I have been tormenting for the past decade. Uh yeah, the dollar's up, but it's the only clean shirt and the dirty hamper. Where are you going to go? The yuan, the yen, the euro, everything else is junk. The dollar is just half decent. How do you respond to that sort of criticism to dollar strength? You know, uh, I, I guess my question is, does it matter? <laughs> I mean, if the, if the dollar's going up because... Who cares? Uh, you know, be, well, because it's got a much higher interest rate <laughs> yeah. than other currencies... Uh, I don't know if I call that uh, be, that it has a clean shirt. I think it's just uh, it has favorable fundamentals, mm-hmm. and, uh, and 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 people should buy things that have favorable fundamentals and not buy things that have lousy fundamentals. So, if the dollar is strong, what does that say about our ability to export? What does that say about global macro travel? Uh, I had a buddy who in the late 90s and early 2000s, the last time the dollar was this strong, was flying to Europe, buying 911s and Z8s and other um, European sheet metal Ferraris, bringing them back to the U.S., converting them and still selling them at a healthy profit versus what what the dealers were asking for uh, because of the strength of the dollar. How does this impact global trade and and other economic factors? Well, it's it, it, it's a big factor. I think you know, keep in mind your supply chain bottleneck problems mm-hmm. are as persistent as ever. So you know, our ability to do what you just said, right, to go and start buying Porsches or something, it's not happening right. because you can't get them. Right. Uh, so some of that stuff has to work itself out independent of the currency. But you know, one of the things that's causing inflation is secular trends such you know such as supply chain problems and mm-hmm. what have you and that's one of the reasons i think inflation is going to be around for a while is those secular trends are slow moving so when you say inflation we're obviously or maybe not so obviously we're not talking eight nine ten percent but we're talking elevated above fed target of two percent correct so four or five percent inflation yeah yeah maybe we get down to four or five but that's a number the fed doesn't like I like four better than nine. Yeah, um, but that still means that so that's we're going to move in the right direction. But mm-hmm. are, but are we going to move as fast as the Fed would like? Uh, I don't think so. And that's why I think people who have this expectation that the Fed is going to be cutting rates uh, sometime in the first or second quarter of next year, I, I'm not sure that's realistic. So so let's assume you're right. We've seen peak inflation, but transitory takes much longer than expected, right. and we slowly work our way down to maybe there's a six handle by the end of the year, five handle, and then sometime next year, 4%. What does that mean in terms of uh, wages and people demanding higher salaries? What does that mean in terms of consumer spending? That has to mean mortgage rates are going to be much higher. What does that mean for housing? And lastly, what does that mean for politics? I can't imagine the present occupant of the White House is happy with that sort of uh, inflation forecast. Yeah, he, I, I, I'm sure he's not, and I'm sure you know the Democratic Party is not very happy going into you know a, a midterm election with really high inflation. Right, and uh, you know I'm not sure uh, for good or for bad politicians are really that involved in managing inflation. Right, right. it's not what they do. Uh, the central banks really have they like that to posture mandate. around it, but but, but, they, but they but they'll take credit or blame accordingly as uh, you know uh, depending on what side of you know, the policy you're on. But I, I think, you know, we're going to have a, a pretty thorny issue, uh, which is that inflation and the uh, thing, the things that need to happen for it to go down just are going to move slowly. 
Mm-hmm. And um, that's, you know, that's my base case. I, I could be wrong. We could, we could really contract quicker. I mean, we, you mentioned that energy prices would come down some, mm-hmm. you know, other commodity prices would come down a lot. But let's also not forget, you know, crude oil is still at about a, a dollar, uh, you know, right now. Uh, and, uh, you know, could it, could it come down? Sure. But it, it's, it hasn't come down that much. Uh, are we going to get down to 80 cents or something like that? <laughs> Maybe, but we're not there. Hmm. Really, really intriguing. And, and last um, market question. So we've seen equity valuations come down. I get the sense you're expecting cheaper valuations, if not much cheaper valuations. Well, I wouldn't go so far as to say much cheaper uh, valuations, but I would say I think uh, the risk is to the downside more than the upside. How do, uh, how do we get there? Do we get there through multiple contraction or do we get I there through price? I think it's really choppy price mm-hmm. behavior. Uh, I mean, we're Stair seeing Stair step that, down? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, you look at some of these rallies, they've had vicious bear market rallies this mm-hmm. year, right? Where the market was up, you know, 3% one day and soon we were 3% the next day and, and so on and so forth. And then the next week's the exact opposite. Right. So I think that kind of erratic behavior, um, maybe not quite as volatile as that, is what I would expect. And I think, you know, there's a lot of money that needs to get deployed. Mm-hmm. And uh, if I'm an investor, I'm an institution, I'm going to have so much in hedge funds, I'm going to have so much in private investing, but I need to be in liquid markets. And Stops I'm not going to do every, I'm not going to just exclusively invest in, you know, alternative assets, if you will. So there is going to be a, a continuing bid for beta um, because institutions need to invest a lot of capital. But where, you know, will the economy continue to support ever higher valuations the way it did the last 10 years? I don't think we're there. Huh. So you, one, one last thing I have to ask. You mentioned institutions sitting with capital. Did, did you imagine, I don't even want to go back to the 80s, but no. even 2000, that there would ever be this many trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars looking for a home. I, I never in my wildest dreams imagined that so much capital would be amassed. H- how do you contextualize all this money looking for a place to be well treated? Yeah, I mean, it's almost hard to fathom. I mean, right? you think about all of you know the quantitative easing that's mm-hmm. gone on and all of the stimulus and all of the capital that there is, all the cash in the world, it's, 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 it's really uh, huge. And um, I, I think that is something that is a positive fundamental for equity prices. Uh, that cash has to get invested somewhere, mm-hmm. sometime, somehow. So even if earnings aren't great, even if the economy continues to look slow, even if inflation is too high, uh, I think there is a, uh, an argument to be made that uh, there's a lot of cash out there looking for a home and that, and that that cash is going to periodically be deployed into equities. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. All right, before I get to my favorite questions, let me just throw a curveball at you. Graham Capital Management's headquarters is at a site named Rock Ledge. This used to be the office of, of General Douglas MacArthur? Correct, yes. Tell us, tell it first, how did you find Rock Ledge and make it the home of of GCM and tell us a little bit about the place. Yeah, no, it, it's a it, back in uh, you know 1994 when I started Graham, uh, we moved into Stanford and we were in Stanford, Connecticut for some number of years, and that was a really good place for us to recruit and retain talent, and a lot of people you know enjoyed as I did uh, the ability to have access to New York City, but you know also have good school systems and what have you in, in the suburbs of New York and, and in Connecticut. And a lot of hedge funds were in Connecticut. Mm-hmm. We outgrew the space in Stanford. And so uh, somebody called me and said, you know, this building in row eight in Connecticut is available and it's pretty amazing. And I went up and I saw it and it's this, you know, beautiful campus setting, you know, with about a hundred thousand square feet of office space. And it, you know, it needed a lot of work, but it was really pretty cool. And so uh, I thought, gee, what a better place! What a great place to try and attract the best people you want to you could find uh, to work in your fund. Uh, from a quality of life, work life uh, perspective, this was just a, an amazing place to run a hedge fund 
to attract really talented people. Um, you know, the success of a hedge fund is all about the people who work there. Mm -hmm. And having a great place to work is not unimportant. It looks like a outcome. college campus. It's it's quite beautiful. Yeah, it, it's been fantastic. We've been there a long time now, and I've enjoyed every minute of it. Huh. Well, glad to hear it. Let's jump to our favorite questions that I ask all of our guests. Starting with, tell us what kept you entertained during the pandemic. What were you uh, watching or listening to? Well, mostly the markets. Uh, you know, <laughs> so uh, obviously being in the position of man of, of of monitoring risk and performance and you know uh position taking of all these traders and trading systems you know I, that's always front and center in my uh you know uh conscious but uh you know uh there have been uh, some really good uh, shows that have come out that i've enjoyed uh you know the there's recently uh, something i've been watching is called uh tehran it's on uh, mm -hmm. apple plus it's a pretty good show jeff bridges in a good show i think it's on fx or something like that called the old man mm -hmm. that's a great show so uh you know uh everyone needs a break from the markets once in a while sure. there's a couple of things i've been watching uh, tell us about your early mentors who helped shape your career. Well, uh, you know, I think about some of the people who uh, really uh, were just, a, a, you know, great, great mentors and, and great people to learn from. Uh, Paul Jones comes to my mind. I met Paul about 40 years ago. And, uh, you know, what an amazing person, philanthropist, great trader, visionary for the world of finance. And, you know, it was very fortunate to have him help me get Graham going back in 1994. He, he's, he's been an insane uh, role model, not just for me, but for a lot of people in mm -hmm. finance. Uh, when I was at Dean Witter, I had a really tough boss named Charlie Fumafredo that ran asset management. Charlie Brooke, no nonsense. Uh, he had a Monday morning meeting at 8 a.m. every Monday, and uh, you know uh, all of his division heads. I was one of them. Had to be down there in the World Trade Center at eight o'clock. And man, I left my house at six because if you got to that office at 8:02, you waited for an hour till the meeting was over outside his office, and then got to explain what you were doing. Uh, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, which wasn't that much fun. So, you know, he was he was a, a great boss because he was no-nonsense and tough as nails. Tell us about some of your favorite books and what are you reading recently? You know, uh, I like uh, spy novels. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, The Portrait uh, of an Unknown Woman, uh, David Silva just came out. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a great book. Uh, I've always, uh, you know, loved... Uh, you know, uh, the trilogy of I talk him is something I read when I, you know, I'm totally stressed out and I want to get into a, another world. That's a, it's a great place to go. Uh, and then I just devour all financial news and technology news and things like that. Huh. Interesting. What sort of advice would you give to a recent college graduate who is interested in a career in macro investment or quantitative trading? You know, here the advice I would give is try and get a job at a really good macro fund that has some really bright people. And if you want to get ahead and you want to be successful, it's really simple. You show up before anyone else. You leave after everyone else. You never are screwing around on the internet. You're paying attention to everything that's happening. And... Trust me, if you have brains and creativity and innovation, there is no industry that rewards you better. Hmm. Quite, quite interesting. And our final question, what do you know about the world of investing today you wish you knew 40 years ago when you were first getting started? You know, that's a tough question. I mean, obviously, on one hand, uh, our trading systems, our traders are so much more sophisticated and so much, it's more complicated. Uh, and... You know, we've learned a lot of lessons about managing risk. We've learned a lot of lessons about being opportunist in certain market cycles and really conservative in other market cycles. And, you know, the, the only way to learn those lessons is through experience and, and making some mistakes and overcoming those mistakes and ultimately prevailing. So, uh, you know, it would have been great <laughs> to never have to learn through, uh, you know, making uh, mistakes, but that's the way the world works. And uh, I think we've been successful 
because we've been intellectually honest with ourselves. We, when we make a mistake, we own it. Huh. Really, really intriguing. Uh, thanks so much, Ken, for being so generous with your time. We have been speaking with Ken Tropin. He is the chairman and founder of Graham Capital Management. If you enjoy this conversation, well, check out any of the previous 400 we've done over the past eight years. You can find those at iTunes, Spotify, wherever you get your favorite podcasts. We love your comments, feedback, and suggestions. Write to us at mibpodcast at bloomberg.net. Sign up for my daily reading list at ritholtz.com. Follow me on Twitter at ritholtz. I would be remiss if I did not thank the crack team that helps these conversations come together so well each week. Sarah Livesley is my audio engineer. Atika Valbrun is my project manager. Paris Wald is my producer. Sean Russo is my head of research. I'm Barry Ritholtz. You've been listening to Masters in Business on Bloomberg Radio.